to talk about um, is some research I've done on the neoliberalization of uh, U.S. universities, uh, U.S. research universities, um, as engines of economic development, as they are uh, now uh, sold. The, the basic logic behind uh, the creation of what's called the entrepreneurial university in the United States, um, and I think increasingly, quite frankly, in Europe is, 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 as well, uh, is that uh, in the context of a market economy in the context of a, an economy increasingly based on knowledge, that universities, as the quintessential knowledge institutions, uh, institutions generating ideas, ideas factories, as they're sometimes called by the uh, less careful uh, uh, promoters of the idea, um, can in fact and should in fact function uh, as engines of economic development. One uh, model is called the so-called triple helix model to obviously glom onto real science um, by calling the triple helix approach to economic development being uh, you know, business, industry, uh, I'm sorry, industry, the university, and government, three layers of, 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 of promoting economic development, as if there's some now scientific theory of how universities can, can promote economic development. But that, the idea behind the entrepreneurial university is that academic research uh, can be commercialized, technology transferred through patents, licensing, and university-based business startups, and, th and this is a sine qua non for regional economic development around the country. Um, Improving the regional economic uh, competitiveness of, uh, of, of cities and regions by forging partnerships with local businesses, commercializing university-generated knowledge, is now regarded, as I said, in this triple helix model as one of the core missions of uh, the university. Indeed, there are new universities being founded in the United States that do not even have the pretense of being anything other than economic development promotion entities. Uh, in Florida, of course, these sorts of things always happen in Florida. Um, but in Florida, there's the South Florida Polytechnic Institute, um, which is basically a university to promote the commercialization of academic research and promote economic development in South Florida. But more uh, flamboyantly, uh, in New York, on, with the uh, subsidy, massive subsidies of the city and under the, uh, uh, under the leadership of uh, soon to be departed uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, uh, New York City uh, solicited bids from the big entrepreneurial universities around the United States, Stanford being one of them, didn't accept Stanford's bid, but has set up a new university, uh, Cornell Technion University, a partnership between Cornell University, a highly prestigious I Ivy League university in the United States, and Technion Institute in Israel, which is a major high-tech uh, uh, high uh, university. And the entire purpose of Cornell Technion is to promote commercializable research and to have close relationships between and between you know, companies, uh, and particularly in the high tech sector, and uh, investments from from Google. I believe Facebook is, is, is also invested, but I know Google is, has provided a, a fair amount of money uh, as well. And in some ways, this I think epitomizes the direction in which this movement toward the entrepreneurial university is going in the United States, and the logic of neoliberalism behind it. That is, that the university is now going to be the driver in the new knowledge economy and that this close relationship needs to exist uh, between uh, university and, uh, and, and the market. Uh, indeed, some claim pro pro uh, supporting this, Richard Atkinson, the former uh, director of the National Science Foundation in the United States and the former head of the University of California system, that this is essential because over 80 percent, and I don't know where this number comes from, you'll see some of the data that I'm going to present in a second which would seem to suggest this isn't the case, but that 80 percent of new industries in the United States actually come from university research so that universities are vital to the creation of these, of, these new in, uh, of these new industries and of the new economy. All right, what I want to do in the small amount of time that I have is to discuss sort of a basic, and I'm not, I don't want to throw a huge amount of data at you at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, um, but to at least provide some evidence about whether there's any truth value to the notion that the entrepreneurial university does, in fact, promote economic development uh, in regions, let alone the question, as John raises, uh, economic development for whom? Even if the university did serve this public purpose of effectively commercializing uh, inventions and effectively commercializing um, uh, knowledge, uh, who actually benefits? Uh, who actually benefits from it? So I want to I want to talk about that. I want to then talk about why those results occur, um, and then I want to talk most importantly, particularly with the theme of this conference, about what the what the social costs are uh, of, of of that approach. Uh, to, uh, to the university and to research and to economic, uh, economic development. Um, I've already gone through this. Um, so let me give you a very quick run through of basic sort of data that I've 
collected and analyzed on the degree to which universities can be drivers of economic development. I've looked at the 60 largest metropolitan areas in the, of, in the United States, the 60 largest regions in the U.S., as well as the central cities in them, to see if there is any relationship between university research, between measures of the commercialization of university research, and so-called economic development outcomes in, the, in those communities. Now, I didn't deal, I'm not dealing in this paper, with the, with the distributional consequences, but just the basic truth value of the claim that overall growth, regardless of who's actually benefiting from it, that overall growth is promoted by this approach. And that, of course, is one of the core tenets of neoliberalism, certainly in the United States, that this market-oriented approach to politics, market-oriented approach to policy, is in fact a growth-oriented uh, policy. Well, the first chart simply shows you the relationship between university research expenditures and GDP growth in metro areas across the country. I've divided the 60, metro, 60 largest metro areas into five uh, quintiles in terms of uh, their, uh, their, their growth. Um, the first qu and their research expenditures. So the first quintile are those universities that have the highest research expenditures in the country. That would be the one on the left. Second quintile, uh, the, the, the next 10 uh, and the next 12 in terms of their research expenditures and so forth. And you can see quite clearly just from these bars that there's no relationship between the amount that universities are spending on research or, again, to show the, the, the perspective, uh, the, the, the highly corporate perspective on these things, on R&D, um, and uh, overall economic, uh, economic growth in, in various regions across the United States. In fact, quite extraordinarily, uh, the universities in the bottom quintile of research expenditures uh, over, the last, um, over the last two decades actually have slightly higher rates, uh, the cities, I should say, the metro areas in which they're located, have slightly higher rates of uh, GDP growth, which seems to be a rather perverse conclusion uh, uh, given the, the, the claims that are made. Similar trend emerges, and again, I'm not going to dwell on these in great detail, when we could correlate university research expenditures over the last 30 years with central city job growth. That is not just the region as a whole, but is this an urban development strategy? Because often cities in which many of these key universities are located promote the development of the uh, entrepreneurial research university as an urban development policy, per se, uh, something that will counter uh, the incredible tendency to suburban sprawl, for example, that, that, that occurs, uh, that exists in, in, in U.S. metro areas with regard to uh, industry, the deconcentration of industry. And you can see there's even less of a relationship between university research expenditures over this 30-year period and central city job growth. Again, the bottom quintile uh, leads the way. Uh, and just so you know, sort of one of the things that probably skews that a little bit, and it's, it's probably changing a little bit after the crash of 2008, by far the leading city in the United States in terms of job growth, in terms of GDP growth, and any other growth indicators over the last uh, two decades uh, has been Las Vegas, Nevada. And so and Las Vegas does not have a major research university. It has some learning experience there, but, you know, but, it, but, it, but it ain't research. Uh, well, it's a different kind of research. Um, and uh, so Las Vegas is at the, at, in the bottom quintile here, which is, which is uh, certainly raising, raising the performance of that quintile. Uh, but that first quintile are you know, the universities uh, located in, in, in uh, the universities that you're quite familiar with, um, like, like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Johns Hopkins University, uh, and the like. And you can see in that first quintile that their growth rate is, is hardly uh, consistent with what the, tr what the claims would be. Um, similarly, there's no relationship, as you can see here, between university research expenditures and metropolitan area startup rates. It's a kind of a crude measure of general entrepreneurship in the economy. So if, in fact, the entrepreneurial university is the ideas factory, um, why in the cities in which, uh, in the metro areas in which those entrepreneurial universities are located, uh, is there not a higher rate of startups uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the community? In fact, again, if you look at the bottom quintile, Las Vegas, a highly entrepreneurial city, I guess, um, uh, leads, uh, lead, leads the way. What I've also done here, and again, I'll go through, through these very quickly, are then correlating these with university commercialization indicators. All right, so the commercialization of research. The first set of charts was simply research. Universities as a research institution. This is now the true entrepreneurial test. There should be a relationship if, in fact, the entrepreneurial university is promoting growth between uh, indicators like patents and university startups and the like and metro area GDP growth, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see, as I'll run through these, uh, the same basic pattern applies. In fact, it's even, it's even more um, 
it's even more stark as, as, as you look at the lack of a relationship between uh, the generation of patents at universities um, and the promotion of general economic growth. Certainly, you would expect a generation of patents to create a, a surge in startups in various industries, in, in various communities. That hasn't happened. Uh, for those of you a little more quantitatively inclined, I've run some correlations uh, on these, uh, and you can see quite clearly there is basically no correlation between any of these indicators, uh, either university R&D and metro area GDP growth, central city growth, metro area startups, and similarly for the commercialization indicator, the key commercialization indicator, uh, patent rates uh, and the like, there's, there's no relationship or very, very, very minor one uh, there. So if you look over just sort of some of these basic cases, you can see Again, these, these all show the same thing, the, you know, the lack of a, of, a, of a clear relationship. These are sort of the classic success stories that are always trotted out. Every city wants to be, uh, and when they promote the entrepreneurial university, the next Silicon Valley, or we're going to be the next MIT. We're going to be the next Research Triangle Park. So here are the places in which those uh, uh, institutions are located. And you can see, and in some cases, there is some relationship between the places that are often extolled as the classic stories of the entrepreneurial success, like Austin. It clearly has had some great indicators over the last 30 years. San Diego has certainly developed uh, the University of California, San Diego, as a, as a successful entrepreneurial university. Um, but you look at the indicators in Raleigh, San Francisco, and Boston, um, and they're not particularly eye-catching. Raleigh a bit. Uh, Raleigh certainly stands out. Um, but as you'll see in a second, there are other factors that explain those economic, uh, those economic results. Um, and the fact is, the flip side of the story for our purposes, or at least my purpose as a critic of the neoliberal approach to the entrepreneurial university, um, are the, 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 the contrary cases, those cases where there ought to be this kind of economic development effect if you believe the neoliberal model. Places like Baltimore with Johns Hopkins University, which is by far the university that has the highest amount of research expenditures in the United States. New Haven, which has a small little university of modest distinction called Yale. Um, Rochester, the University of Rochester, again, a highly distinguished university. Birmingham, Alabama, believe it or not, the University of Alabama, Bir uh, Birmingham has a pretty high uh, amount of, of uh, research uh, through, its, through its medical school, through biomedical, um, and Pittsburgh, which is often touted as a turnaround city because of the degree to which it's uh, uh, created a, a so-called EDS and MED strategy. You can see here that these places um, are very high in terms of the ranking on economic uh, stagnation. And on the other hand, I mentioned Las Vegas, and there are some others that have very low amounts of, of university R&D, very low amounts of um, uh, commercialization, but high economic performance. All right, what are the reasons for this? Why is the university seemingly not, aside from the fact that we as critics of neoliberalism, neoliberalism would say, well, you know, it does, because it's so skewed and so unequal, it's not going to promote this kind of economic growth. But why are universities not uh, the silver bullet for regional economic development? There are a lot of factors um, that, that, that I want to mention very briefly. One is that the university even if we are in an era of ideas, even if we are in a knowledge economy, the university is still just one player in all of that. Um, the university, for example, provides, universities uh, provide about um, $31 million a year, the major funders of, of, of R&D in the United States. Industry is $280 million. But the more interesting figure are the major performers of R&D, because a lot of money is sent from the federal government to universities to conduct uh, research and development. And basically, by a ratio of five to one, the private sector conducts more research and development than does academia, about $311 billion a year in the US to $61 billion a year. So it's about a five to one ratio. So that corporations like Microsoft, uh, which spends about $9 billion a year in research, uh, Cisco Systems, uh, Boeing, about six and a half billion dollars a year. Intel. There are a number of these companies that still spend extraordinary amounts of R&D. The highest amount of the university that spend is two billion dollars. Johns Hopkins University. All right. So one thing to understand is that the university, as it simply, is a small cog, I guess I would say, in the overall economic development machine. Secondly, and related to that, universities, even as they have increased since Bayh-Dole and other neoliberal policies to encourage this kind of entrepreneurship, universities nevertheless produce a trivial percentage of patents and startups in the United States. Uh, it's actually been quite stagnant over the last 10 
to 15 years, um, even as universities have increasingly devoted uh, greater and greater amounts of their resources to uh, the entrepreneurial activities. They produce, uh, universities produce around 3.5% uh, of all U.S. owned patents, about 2% of all patents in the United States, with no increase in share since 2000. And universities uh, typically generate fewer than 1%. Let me repeat that. Typically generate fewer than 1% of all the startups in metropolitan areas. So every uh, entrepreneurial chancellor or president at a university in the United States who talks about the need to develop and nurture entrepreneurial activities to develop the next Google or the next Apple uh, out of their university um, does not acknowledge the fact that universities uh, are producing a, a small number of these startups. And I just have some examples from cities here that I'm, that I'm, that I'm going to run through, and I'll, I'll skip over the, the, the research uh, uh, parks example, to go, I think, to the, to the more important question, which I don't have a, a lot of time to talk about, and that is, what are the costs of all this? If it's not producing the economic growth that the neoliberal ideology argues that this approach is going to produce, um, what is actually happening to universities uh, uh, as, 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 a consequence, uh, as a consequence of it? Well, one is, one of the dirty little secrets about the entrepreneurial university is that it is a major drain on the resources available to universities for, okay, I'm going to play my card here, the real purposes of the university. Um, the argument, of course, is that the entrepreneurial university is a cash cow, that it generates resources, that patents and licenses and spin-outs bring in money. Stanford, for example, uh, has brought in $1.3 billion uh, over the last 30 years uh, in, in, in uh, licensing fees in, in their share of startup companies like, uh, like Google or Genentech, um, MIT, similarly. Um, and so the argument is made that uh, the entrepreneurial university can bring in those resources and deal with the fiscal crisis of the state in supporting particularly uh, 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 public universities. Well, as you can see, the... <clears throat> There are a relatively small number of universities in the U.S. bringing in more than a million dollars a year in uh, licensing income. In other words, the technology that they're transferring is bringing in about a million, a million dollars or more uh, in, in uh, about, uh, I get the exact percentage, well, let me go back. 41, about 50, about 55 percent of U.S. universities are generating over about a million dollars a year. Now, why is that an important figure? Because the average technology transfer office in the United States to run it costs a little over a million dollars a year. So any university that is not making over a million dollars a year in licensing fees is essentially taking money away from the history department, um, the economics department, um, so wherever, and essentially devoting it to these entrepreneurial activities on the bogus argument that these entrepreneurial activities are serving the public purpose of promoting overall economic growth. All right, so it's supposed to be a win-win for the community. The win-win of the entrepreneurial university is that it's going to promote overall economic growth, and it's going to bring resources to the university to, in the case of public universities, limit the, the, the burden of the taxpayers. Um, it doesn't do that in over half, well, in a little bit under half of the cases of universities uh, doing this around, around the country. Um, essentially, what tech transfer is, is a casino. In fact, I love John's point about the university becoming the microcosm of the larger societal inequality, and you can see it in the, in the, in the share of resources that are garnered from, from tech transfer. Um, the top five universities in the United States, that's five universities, garner 43% of all of the licensing fees in, in any given year, or in, in the most, most recent given year, uh, 2011. The next 10 garner 29%. So 15 universities pull in 72% of all of the uh, uh, tech transfer revenues uh, in, in, in the United States. Um, all the rest uh, bring in about 27%. I mean, it's not quite the 99% versus the 1% in terms of the overall distribution of wealth in the economy, but it does show the degree to which there is a, 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 a clear uh, concentration of resources. So there, there are some universities that clearly do succeed, that clearly do make money on this. In fact, 
uh, Drew Faust, the president of Harvard, got herself in trouble about a year into her presidency by basically saying uh, what is in fact the, the, the case, that there are about 10 or 15 universities in the country who can do this kind of level of science, this kind of level of research that can promote the kind of commercialization of, 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 of science uh, that will in fact bring in uh, revenues. And of course, other universities wanting to be part of this entrepreneurial game said, no, 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 that's not true. Back off. You're, you're denigrating from your perch at Harvard, uh, the uh, uh, public universities around the country. But in fact, uh, that, is, uh, that, that, is, that is the case. So, so cost number one is a financial one. Universities, by and large, are losing money and diverting resources to these, to these activities. Some other costs. The fact that there is a cost to the university mission, uh, 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 the mission of uh, open science, blue sky science, uh, the quality of scientific research. Uh, Phil Morosky, uh, who was cited earlier, has done some interesting work on this. But focusing in on patents and spinoffs um, has the possibility, and in many cases uh, some of the research has shown, uh, of uh, redirecting research away from the things that will ultimately perhaps lead to the big, uh, the big uh, commercial, uh, the, the big, the big commercial uh, breakthroughs. Uh, Paul Burr. Uh, one of the fathers of biotechnology, uh, in a, in a really revealing interview, uh, talked about the fact that had he been involved in the early 1970s in close uh, relationships with industry, the, the, the nascent biotechnology industry, um, that the leaders of biotechnology at that time didn't think that where he was going theoretically in terms of gene splicing was really going to lead to the breakthroughs they wanted. And he said, Okay, thank you. He did what he did, got the Nobel Prize, and he, uh, Boyer and Cohen, uh, from that, uh, ultimately launched a very successful company you may have heard of called Genentech, which is now owned by Roche and has made some, you know, some major discoveries. Berg's point, though, was that science requires distance. Science requires scientists following their noses. Science requires so-called blue sky research, and that ultimately that will perhaps produce major commercial, uh, commercializable research, but that the close relationship actually is somewhat antith uh, potentially antith antithetical to that. Um, so that the injection of the profit motive into the scientific research process may in fact in, uh, distort the kinds of questions that get investigated and degrade the quality uh, of, uh, of, of results. The other potential cost, a major cost, um, is, you know, let's, let's call it what it is, outright corruption of the academic process. The fact that you have a close relationship with private uh, sector uh, individuals, private sector corporations um, who have a vested interest in your research has led to a raft of revelations over the last uh, decade of scientific fraud, in the interest of obviously uh, commercializability, um, ghost writing of journal articles, which has become, uh, you know, in, particularly in the biomedical field, uh, rampant, the establishment of quote unquote research institutes, such as an institute at McGill University on uh, asbestos, which demonstrated that the purported harm of asbestos was really exaggerated, funded by the asbestos industry. Um, a fracking institute set up at the State University of New York at Buffalo, funded by uh, you know, hydraulic fracturation, right, the uh, shale gas uh, industry, to demonstrate that that's really a safe practice. Um, faculty rose up on that and actually got that, uh, that institute uh, disestablished. Penn State University established one as well. BP established an institute at, uh, at, at Berkeley, which caused a, 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 a whole bunch of, of controversy. This has become an increasingly common, uh, common problem at universities. And so the question, obviously, of the degree to which the research gets uh, corrupted is important. All right, let me get a final point. I probably only have two, three minutes, right? Um, if these university partnerships, if the privatization of uh, research, if the entrepreneurial process isn't generating the large growth that um, is purported uh, to, to be to the case by advocates, um, if in fact there are these obvious costs in terms of the financial costs at the university, in terms of the, the, the integrity of research uh, and the like, um, why is this such an unstoppable movement? Um, and maybe that's a stupid question to ask, given the discussions that we've had about the nature of power and neo neoliberalism and the like. But I'd like to at least spend a couple minutes outlining for you the, I guess I would call it, 
if I wanted to get somewhat technical and, and push the argument a little bit, um, a rent-seeking coalition. That is, individuals who, in economist terms, want to establish a regulatory framework or a policy framework in which they can, uh, rather than generating true value, extract rent uh, from policies. And there is, I think, a, a, a rent-seeking coalition that makes the, university, the entrepreneurial university a very powerful a force indeed, uh, a, a certain ideological contagion, as I, as I call it, uh, from research commercialization. First of all, there are obvious promoters and lobbyists, people who make money from this. Uh, the Association of uh, University uh, Technology Managers, people who work uh, in tech transfer offices uh, across universities. The Association of University Research Parks. Um, they have a vested interest in saying these are major economic development uh, uh, major economic development benefits. So tech transfer managers and administrators. University administrators, increasingly, make their careers as economic development managers. Um, presidents and chancellors. There are now vice chancellors for economic development, actually, uh, at, at most universities uh, in the United States. Part of the coalition are clearly entrepreneurial scientists. People saw that Boyer and Cohen made millions from Genentech, um, and uh, that uh, scientists can, in fact, uh, score big, uh, big, big amounts of money. Regional corporate leadership, which pushes the so-called alignment of the entrepreneurial university with the regional economy, pushing it not only in terms of research, but also in terms of curriculum uh, and, and the like. And then a larger group of players that are sort of fairly obvious. So the biotech and, and big pharma industry uh, that can get highly subsidized research from the universities, patent lawyers who make a lot of those fees that cost tech transfer offices over a million dollars a year, and uh, politicians who want to claim credit for uh, what, what they will call uh, economic development. And maybe this all came together to me in, in sort of one symbolic moment, uh, a meeting uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, early last year of a new organization called the President's Investors Summit, in which coming together to discuss universities and what they should be doing are presidents of universities, the other administrators specializing in economic development, venture capital funds, um, local corporate, uh, potential corporate partners, to basically talk about the university as a place to, you know, in some place, divvy up shares and to make investments and to, and, 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 and to look, at, uh, look, at, look at futures contracts. And so consequently, um, you have a situation where the evidence is fairly overwhelming that the entrepreneurial university doesn't promote the benefits that are purported, that it does have substantial costs to local communities, but there is an unstoppable coalition. Um, and unless voice or some of the other mechanisms that have been talked about earlier uh, are, are, are put into, uh, put into place, uh, this is in fact going to be uh, the continuing future of the American university. Thank you.